Good morning, y'all. Whoa. Sound like I was screaming at you, didn't it? It was all caps. Hey, um, just it made me think about something when I was watching the announcement video. Uh, the jail ministry that Richard was talking about, just so you know, that's been going on, I want to say, since September, October, so whatever that, four or five months. About 30 women have given their life, their lives to Christ in that. Y'all, that is why we do what we do. That's why we're on the streets. That's why the foster care uh, prevention ministry is, is happening. That's why, you know, the that's why we have um, trail tots and trail kids, and that's why you know we're we're um, in the jail. That's why we have a a ministry in an assisted living center. All of that is helping people find their way back to God. That is why it is all about Christ, and that is why we do everything that we do around here. So, so, I want to welcome, welcome y'all here. My name is Ed Griffin Hagen. I'm one of the pastors on our staff at Church on the Trail. I want to welcome you here. If this is your first time here, we're super excited that God has ordained for you to be here with us this morning and worship. And that worship, the music was incredible. I mean, it was just incredible. Hopefully, that prepared our hearts and prepared our minds to hear a little, to hear a word from the Lord. If it is your first time here, we want to get this little welcome kit in your hands, and it just gives you a little bit of the DNA of our church and kind of who we are, and we'll answer some questions that you may have. And Richard and Ron are standing here. If it's your first time or if you've never seen one of these, if you'll raise your hand, they'll get one in your hand. Now, y'all do know that Easter is, uh, uh, is almost upon us, and Easter uh, at church on the, we have a little bunny. We have a little bunny. Thank you. About knocked her head off. Oh, I got an egg, and I got thank you very much. I appreciate it. So Easter is y'all give the Easter bunny a little round. Look, you know we are so sold out on on helping people find their way back, on leading people to the foot of the cross. Easter is is for, and should be for every church on, around the, the globe, is Super Bowl Sunday. And we have always done Easter in a big way. So Easter, again this year, will be on our church land right down the street. Um, it's on the 12th. Church of uh, worship will be at 11 o'clock. Anyway, we have, and you'll see on the screen, if you'll throw that egg slide up there, egg slide. Um, we need, we have a big egg hunt after church for the kids. You know, there'll be food vendors, there'll be barbecue, there'll be kids activities, face paint, whatever. There'll be all kind of stuff after um, the worship service, and we need 10,000 eggs. Every year we do 10,000 eggs. And so you'll see this, you can get at Walmart and Sam's, they're already filled. We need them filled with candy. If you, you know, you can buy candy and bring it in, there'll be a place out here to bring it. Uh, you can bring empty eggs, you can bring candy, or you can bring these that are already full. But let me, let me say this, and this is going to sound silly, but don't get stuff that's too big to go in there. Because if it's too big to go in there, guess where it's not going to go? Say in there, right? It won't fit. And please don't bring chocolate, because guess what happens to chocolate? In the, it melts. And so get stuff that will fit and don't do chocolate. Um, the second thing about Easter is it takes a lot of us locking arms together in unity and serving because we'll have probably a thousand people or so that'll, that'll come. And the reason why Easter is such a big deal for us and really should be a big deal for all of us is a lot of times that's the only real day of the year that a lot of people will show up at church. They'll show up and they may be giving God and His church one last chance. It may be the one time that they're going to hear the gospel. And, and you know what? They're going to hear the gospel. They're going to hear the whole gospel. And they're going to see a church that is, that is unified, that is loving on them. And it takes a lot of people to pull that off. And so there's sign-up sheets out there for people to serve um, for Easter. There, you know, and it, it, here's, the, here's the numbers of people that it takes. You know, we need 10 or 15 people to kind of serve in parking. We need 20 people to serve in the teardown, to tear down everything. We need about 25 people to be greeters. We need 10 people in the cafe. We need 25 or 30 people to work, kind of serve in the Easter egg 
hunt. We need five or six people. We have, we'll have a prayer tent, and there will be people in that prayer tent. So we need people serving in that prayer ministry. It, it's a listen. It's a big. It is a big deal pulling off Easter down at that. How many of y'all have been to Easter on the land down there? Listen, tons of people every year. They cross that street onto that property lost. And when they cross back over that street, they're found. It happens every single year. We're praying over every one of the seats that people sit in. The whole thing is just bathed in prayer and it's a big deal. And we can't do it without y'all's help, so I'm asking y'all to help. Now, with that said, we are uh, in week three of a walkthrough that we're, we're walking through the Old Testament book of, of Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Can y'all say that? I still love saying that. One, two, three. Habakkuk. So Habakkuk is recording um, in his prophecy, in his book, <clears throat> he's recording this, this private conversation between himself and God, and he's writing this down for the benefit, at the end of the day, for the benefit of the people. The prophet, he asked God some questions here at the beginning. We're in chapter 2 now, but he asked God some questions about his ways, and God answers those questions, and Habakkuk's words, they show us, they show us a righteous way to bring our concerns to God when God's ways seem completely inconceivable. Last week, we sort of struggled through, at least I struggled through, God's response to Habakkuk's first question, and then Habakkuk's response back to God. Today, we're going to look at at verse 2 of chapter 2 through the end of the chapter. Verse 2 begins with the, the uh, verse 2 of chapter 2, with the Lord's answer to the prophet. And if you remember last week, we left Habakkuk at the very beginning of chapter 2 in verse 1. He's standing on watch and he's waiting. And one of our takeaways last week was there's a time to stop and to wait and to listen and to pray and wait for God to respond. And so the very next verse um, begins uh, the Lord's answer back to the prophet. I want to give you this morning a, a pretty quick flyover of chapter 2 from verse 2 to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> and, and, and I want to fly through that. The first thing that, uh, that the Lord tells Habakkuk in this response, he says, write it down. He says, preserve it. You see that on the, screen, on the screen. It says, Lord, answer me and said, write the vision down. And he says, write it down. Because it's almost like he says, I know that, um, that in early 2020 in West Central Georgia, this little church, Church on the Trail, is going to be studying these words. So Habakkuk, write it down. Now, now, really what the Lord is saying, though, is he's saying that my word, my word is not just for some select few people in some secret inner circle. He's saying my word is, is for a wider audience. My word is for a wide audience for all time across all geography. And then he starts in verse 5, and the prophet records the Lord laying down a series of five, one, two, three, four, five woes on the Chaldeans. Remember that this, these people, the Chaldeans, were a nasty, brutal, fearsome, dreaded, evil people who at the end of the day, about 15 or 20 years later, will come in, invade Judah and ransack Jerusalem and take the people captive. It's in, that happens in 586 B.C. That's 15 or 20 years after Habakkuk writes what he writes. So in these next 15 or so verses, the, uh, uh, the Lord is laying down five woes. Anybody know what a woe is? A woe is like, you better look out because it's coming. Woe is A woe is like there's calamity on the horizon. There's there's affliction, there's ruinous kind of trouble. And so in this section of chapter 2, God is letting Habakkuk know that Nebuchadnezzar, if you remember Nebuchadnezzar's the king of the Chaldeans, Nebuchadnezzar is their ruler, and so God is letting Habakkuk know that Nebuchadnezzar and the Chaldeans at the end of the day are going to get what's coming. Their, their doomsday ultimately is coming. Now their judgment here in this book their judgment is not explicitly described, but it's absolutely implied from verse 6 through the end of the chapter. So that is a quick flyover of chapter 
two of the Lord's response. And I want us to dive in. I want us to really look at verse 4 of chapter 2. I think that verse 4 of chapter 2 of Habakkuk is one of the absolute most important verses in all of the scriptures. It is definitely the key to this little book of Habakkuk. And it really does, y'all, it gives us a key to the three great doctrinal letters in the New Testament, um, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. And we're going to get to those in a second, but first, verse 4 is on the screen, and it says, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. The just shall live by his faith. Is that verse alluding to salvation, like we are saved by grace through faith. Is that what Habakkuk is talking about? Is it a salvation thing? Is, is that what Habakkuk is saying way back six or seven hundred years before Paul even penned those words and wrote about it, the just shall live by? Is that eternal life that Habakkuk is talking about? Or is Habakkuk talking about um, right living, about, about a, a good way to live your life, about uh, living a righteous life? So is it about eternal life or is it about living, quote, right? I think it's both. But I think the emphasis is on eternal life because the quotations of this verse in the New Testament three times kind of lean that way. All right, this verse in Habakkuk, it paints this picture of two ways that are available to me and you, two roads that we can travel down. It mentions two very distinct different buckets of people. The first bucket of people is the proud. The New King James uses the word proud. The ESV uses the words puffed up, puffed up. The meaning here is really speaking about people who are swelled up with pride. They're, they're swelled up with pride in that first bucket. The second bucket of people that, that Habakkuk writes about is in contrast to the first, and they're the just the New King James calls them the just. The ESV calls them the righteous. The righteous shall live by his faith. In other words, these two buckets of people, you could really call them the lost and the saved. Those that have trusted God and those that have not. Verse 4 uh, in Habakkuk chapter 2, it, it introduces us to a major league principle that the Lord has laid down. And I know you're not going to want to do this, but go back in your mind to a high school math class. Maybe it's like geometry or something. I don't know. In geometry class, you accepted certain axioms, A-X-I-O-M-S, certain axioms, certain things that were just, um, just obviously true. You didn't have to prove them like a, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Things that are just obviously true. And there are certain axioms, certain statements in the scriptures, which are great axioms. This is one of those. Behold the proud. The, his soul is not upright in him. The ESV says, behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. That's describing, y'all, a group of people who are just welled up with pride. And in context, Habakkuk's talking about the Chaldeans. They are ate up with pride. They're boastful in their, in their fearsomeness and in their dread. They're boasting about the way that they kill people. That principle applies, though, across time. Behold the proud. Either they're attempting to work out their own salvation because they're so dang self-important, they can just take care of it all themselves, or they're just living for today with this mindset of, of party hard and have fun because you may be gone tomorrow. For that group of people, t tomorrow, it ain't about tomorrow. His, the text says his soul is not upright within him. He is wrong. Lo yashra is the Hebrew. Lo yashra. The word lo means no or not. And yashra means good or right or straight or level or approved. So the text says, his soul is crooked. His soul is not straight. His soul is not upright. His soul is not um, approved. He's going, in other words, 
down the wrong road. This bucket of people, they're going down the wrong road. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 25 says, There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There is no doubt a whole bunch of folks in the world that are sitting in that bucket. They have a puffed up soul. They're riddled with pride as they wander down this road of life, just seeing what's going to happen next. And as they they slowly float down that river, they're finally going to arrive at a sea of destruction. That is their end. Destruction is their end. And that bucket of folks is contrasted uh, with, uh, in verse 4, this second group of people. And what does the text say about second group of people? It says, they're the, but the just shall live by his faith. They're floating down a little bit of a different river. Their end is not destruction. They're heading towards the city of God. They're heading towards, um, towards a full understanding a full understanding of the one, the very one who breathed life into mankind. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he said this. He said, for now, now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. He says, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as, all, as I am known. Y'all, between the moment of salvation, between the second that we're saved and the then, the saved ones, the believers, the Christians, will walk by faith. We will walk by faith. We may not have all the answers to our questions now, but God will give those to us as we come into his presence. Now, because Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 is quoted three times in the New Testament, and it's actually the key to the epistle the letter of Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews, I want to look at those three time, the three times that, that, those, uh, that this verse is used a little more carefully. In Romans, in the letter to, to the Romans, the emphasis is on justification by faith for salvation. Justification, churchy word. But justification is that moment in time, really, at the end of the day, where you're saved, where you're pardoned. You're freed from the punishment due because Christ paid for it. That's that, that's that moment of justification. Romans chapter 1 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for people, excuse me, for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Verse 17, For in, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as, as it is written, and here's where he quotes Habakkuk, the just shall live by his faith. The point here is that the just, the righteous that Habakkuk is talking about, the one who's been justified by faith shall also live by faith. That's a great message in the letter to the Romans, in Paul's letter to the Galatians. The quotation is this, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. The emphasis there is a little different because right before that in chapter 2 of Galatians, Paul wrote, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Y'all, it is a salvation thing. In Romans, the emphasis is on justification by faith for salvation. In Galatians Two, the emphasis on, is on the faith that saves, but it's also on a faith that, that you live out throughout your entire life. In Hebrews, we're going to land in Hebrews today, begins chapter 10. In fact, you've got to know that the whole book of Hebrews, which was written primarily towards Jews, towards Hebrews, it makes the case, the whole book makes the case that Christ and Christianity is, a, is better. It's a superior thing to the old, uh, the old ways of the old covenant. The word better in Hebrews is used 12 times in the book. Jesus is better than the angels. He's better. He's a better prophet. He's better than Moses. He's better than Joshua. He made a better sacrifice. He established a better covenant. And that faith is a better way to live. So anyway, he begins chapter 10. Chapter 10, talking about 
that the sacrifice of animals was insufficient. He talks about that the blood of bulls and goats doesn't get it, that it cannot remove sin. The whole sacrificial system that Israel was under, he says all of that doesn't get it. You're slaying all the animals, but that doesn't get it. It doesn't remove the sin. He goes on, though, and he says the offering of Jesus Christ's body takes care of that sin once and for all. He talks about a new and living way. And then in Hebrews 10, 38, he quotes the prophet Habakkuk towards the very end of chapter 10. He says, now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And he continues in verse 39, but... We are not of those who draw back to perdition. That's another kind of churchy word that just means destruction or destroyed. But we are not of those who draw back and are destroyed. That's what perdition means. But, he says, we are of those who believe, not just for the sake of believing, but we believe to the saving of the soul. And so the writer of Hebrews, and we don't know who, we really don't know who wrote Hebrews, but the writer here is contract, uh, contrasting, just like Habakkuk did, the lost and the saved. Those living uh, in faith and those not. Habakkuk says of the Chaldeans, his soul is not upright in him. The writer of Hebrews says of the believers, we are those who believe to the saving of the soul. And so the main thrust in all of these passages is for those who are declared righteous by God, faith will be the core around which all of their life revolves. To shrink back or to draw back from that to be, is to be arrogant, to be prideful, to be, um, here's a made-up word, Nebuchadnezzarish, right? Nebuchadnezzar, that's a, an adverb now or an adjective. Now, Neb, don't be Nebuchadnezzarish. All of that, what is it? It exposes a lack of righteousness, y'all. It exposes lostness. And therefore, it's not pleasing to God. Hebrews eleven six says, without what? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Biblical faith is such a big deal. Y'all, and it's so easy to go down the wrong road about this. Like when you read the Bible, like, almost like it used to be that we were saved by works or that we were saved by the law and that faith wasn't an issue. Y'all, that's heresy. It is heresy. Look back at Abraham. 1,800 years before the cross, what was said about him? 1,800 years. Genesis 15. It says, and he, Abraham, believed in the Lord and he, the Lord, accounted it to him for righteousness. So I want us to spend the rest of today talking about faith, about biblical faith, what it is and what it does. And I think to understand biblical faith, to understand it appropriately, we almost have to talk about what it's not. And it's not the ability to somehow manipulate God, to turn God into some genie in a bottle that will give me a new car and a new house if I just believe enough. That is not biblical faith. That mindset, y'all hear this, that mindset sees faith as having one goal, one fruit, and that is a life of comfort. You are not called as a believer to be comfortable. That is not the calling of the Christian. In fact, the scripture probably leans way more to we're called to be uncomfortable, right? That is not biblical faith. Faith is not some... Uh, some blind, ignorant leap into the dark. To many people, faith is, is anti-science. You know how many times in my life I've had people say, Ed, you're smarter than that. Like faith, like faith and science are mutually exclusive and can't live inside the same brain like we're just supposed to check our, our brain at the door. That, that is not faith either. That's not. Faith is not positive thinking. Faith is not just some hunch, some gut feeling. Faith is not uh, just hoping for the best that everything's just going to turn out all right. Faith is not just some feeling of optimism. Faith is not a devotion to whatever, quote, God you may be happening to follow in the moment. 
Faith is none of those things. But faith has been identified. No, faith has been misidentified as that. Well, there's what it's not. Well, what is it? Hebrews chapter 11 gives us, been called the faith chapter in all of the Bible. And the very first verse of Hebrews 11 gives us this definition. It says that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Another translation reads the evidence of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Real faith, authentic faith, genuine faith is a confident obedience to the truth, the truths in God's word, independent of circumstance and independent of consequence. That first word that's translated confidence or substance, it's hypostasis in Greek. It literally means to stand uh, underneath and to support and to undergird something. Faith is the foundation that gives a believer the confidence to stand. Faith is to a Christian what the foundation is to a house. You pour a slab and the house is sitting solid on that foundation. Right? Faith is the basis. Faith is the guarantee of what we hope for. And we can really, really want something to be a reality, to become a reality. But we may feel down deep inside somehow a little bit unsure. Well, it's faith that bridges the gap. When we believe that what we hope for will in fact become a reality, faith bridges that gap. When a believer has faith, biblical, genuine, authentic faith, it is God's way of giving him confidence and assurance that what God's promised will absolutely, for sure, no doubt about it, be experienced. Does that make sense? It's faith that does that. That what is promised will become a reality. Now, second part of that verse, the evidence, faith, the evidence of things not seen. That second word that describes what faith is, is evidence. It's also translated conviction. The ESV uses the word conviction. It's this inward conviction that allows a believer to believe things that he hasn't seen yet. That God performs what God's promised because it's just who he is. It's just in his very nature. He's a promise keeper. It's a legal term. And that legal term means evidence that's accepted for a conviction. Evidence is something that you take to court to do what? To prove your case. The lawyer takes evidence in. He proves his case. Faith is the evidence that me and you take to court to prove that what we can't see is just as real as if we see it. Right? Right? Faith isn't a leap into the dark. Faith is not uh, some hope-so thing. It's assurance and conviction. It's, it's substance and evidence. It's substance for a scientific mind, and it's evidence for a legal mind. Faith is believing that there's another dimension to life other than what we can touch and see and smell and feel. Y'all, when my son, my oldest son, Zach, six or seven years old, he's flying a kite. One spring day, 1998, 1999, he was around seven years old. The kite goes up. We're in a, living in a cul-de-sac. He's standing out in the street, and the kite's flying up, and there's some super low-lying clouds, and the kite kind of goes up into the low-lying clouds, and there was this old guy that lived across the street named Mr. Tom. Mr. Tom's this cool old guy, and Mr. Tom walks outside, and he says to Zach, hey, what you doing with that string in your hand? And Zach says to Mr. Tom, Mr. Tom, I'm flying a kite. And Mr. Tom looks up and all he sees is the clouds. And he said, little man, I don't see a kite up there anywhere. And Zach said this, profound words from a seven-year-old. He said, I don't see it either, Mr. Tom, but I know it's up there because every once in a while there's a little tug on my string. Y'all, that story makes me totally think about faith. And I know that the world, a lot of the time, looks at faith like you're foolish. If you believe, you must be foolish because you can't possibly believe those things. I told you. The night I got saved, I told my mom. She says to me, you don't actually believe in the resurrection. And I said, well, that's a pretty 
big part of this whole Christian thing, I think. And she says, you're smarter than that, as if you're supposed to check your brain at the door. And so I think about that kite flying thing with Zach, and I think that uh, I still trust God, and I keep looking up, and every once in a while I feel that same little tug. Faith believes that God, in His grace, has stepped over the boundary of human history and told us some incredible things, some valuable things, and made some incredible promises to me and you. Faith believes those things. And faith not only believes those things, faith adjusts its life to those things. And faith walks based on that. And if you really want to believe, you can, y'all, you can believe all kind of crazy stuff. The Lord doesn't want you to do that. He wants your faith to rest on Him. He is to be the object of our faith. The object of our faith is a key ingredient to this whole thing. It's not just faith for faith's sake. You watch TV and you see some Muslim cleric on TV and it says, Imam Bubla Bubla, and it says, now nah, I probably shouldn't have said that that way, but it says, a man of faith. Well, it's, his faith is misguided. So it's not just faith for faith's sake. 175 years ago, Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, it is, this is such a great quote. He said, it is not your joy in Christ that saves you. It is Christ. It is not your hope in Christ that saves you. It is Christ. He said, it's not even your faith in Christ, though that be the instrument. It is Christ's blood and merit. He is the object of our faith. So the object of your faith is critical to this whole thing. you got to understand, it's not just faith for faith's sake. Verse 3 of Hebrews 11 says this, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. We weren't there. At least I wasn't there. I don't imagine any of y'all were there. We didn't see the words that God used to bring everything into existence. But since that's what the Bible says, you see, Genesis 1 records the words God said nine times. So since that's what the Bible said, faith understands that behind everything that is visible, everything that we can see and touch and feel and smell are the invisible commands of a holy God. Faith is the evidence. Faith is the conviction of that truth. The rest of Hebrews 11 gives us Old Testament example after example of men and women with that kind of faith. He begins in verse 4 with Cain and Abel. It says in verse 4, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Why was Abel's sacrifice better or more important than Cain's? The writer of Hebrews suggests that it came from a heart that had been transformed, a heart that had been made righteous through faith. And that was in contrast with Cain's heart, which was bitter and prideful. The writer of Hebrews talks in detail about Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Rahab. Rahab, who, by the way, was a prostitute. Rahab, who, by the way, was the great, 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 great grandmammy of Jesus. So this guy, whoever it is that wrote Hebrews, is clearly, he is making a, a case that it has always been about faith. Since the very beginning, it's always been about faith. He goes on in verse 32, and he says, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through what? Through faith subdued kingdoms. Through faith worked righteousness. Through faith obtained promises. Through faith stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of a sword, out of weakness were made strong through what? Through faith became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of aliens. So in this little discussion on faith, we've been looking at faith as a noun, as a thing. Abel had faith, Abraham had faith, Moses had faith, yada, 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 yada. It's a verb too. It's an action word. Faith acts. Faith acts. There was a little farming community in Kansas, y'all, and it hadn't rained. They were having a drought. been a long time since it rained. And the pastors of all the churches in that area call a prayer meeting. They're going to get the whole town together, and they're going to pray. 
and they said, look, we want, we want everybody to come together, all the different churches, different denominations, different this and that. We want you to bring your religious, quote, symbols with you. So the whole town shows up, and people brought Bibles, and people brought, brought crosses, and the Catholics brought rosaries, and, and they all cry out to God. They finish this prayer meeting, there ain't no rain. They all go home kind of dejected. The next day, though, in the town square uh, where they had that meeting, this little boy shows up. And the little boy gets on his knees and he's like, Lord, we need rain. Lord, please let it rain. God, bring the rain through your power. The day before, you had all the preachers and all the pastors and all the holy people there doing the same thing with all their little religious symbols and stuff, doing the exact same thing, no rain. The little boy shows up the next day by himself in the town square and as he was praying, the sky got darker. And as he was, as he was praying, the skies kind of start rumbling. And as he was praying, the shower hit and it started pouring down rain. What was it that was different about that little boy? He had said the same things the holy people, the preacher, the pastor and all, had said the day before. He, he, they all brought their little uh, religious symbols. But that day, that young boy came, that day when the clouds started getting dark, that day when the, when, when the clouds started rumbling, the symbol that that little boy lifted up was an umbrella. That was the symbol that he brought. What did that umbrella depict? Trust and faith and belief. He expected that it was going to rain. Y'all, we act based on what we believe to be true. You sat down in that chair 20 or 30 minutes ago and you didn't question whether that chair was going to hold you up. When you went in the bathroom this morning, you flipped the light on. You didn't question whether the light was going to come on or not, we act based upon what we believe to be true. It guides our actions. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we walk by, as believers, we walk by faith, not by sight. Paul says simply we take God for his word. We trust him because we believe that he is who he says he is. We believe that he can do everything that he says he can do as believers we trust him and we walk by faith. Why do we do that? Because he's trustworthy, right? The object of our faith is trustworthy. Therefore, whatever he says is worthy of being trusted. Whatever he says is worthy of, of believing. He is our father and we trust him. Years ago, y'all, I was in my home office and I'm working in the office. There's a window on the left side of the desk that I was sitting at. And Zach and Will were about 10 and 7 at the time. And I was hard at work. Hard at work. They come in, and I'm half listening to them. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm honest and transparent. I was probably 25% listening to them. They walked in, and they said, I'm told, they said, can we build a, can we build a tree house in the backyard? And I was deep in thought, working, 25% listening. I said, yeah, yeah, whatever. 30 minutes or so later... I'm out of the corner of my eye. There's this walking back and forth on the, on the outside of the window, toting stuff back and forth. I mean, I don't even know what they were doing. It was totally disrupting me. And so I scream out, Susan, what are your children doing? You know, what are your children doing? They're doing something out there. And you know what she said? She comes in there and she says, they asked if y'all could build a tree house. And you said yes. And they believed you. They believed you. You want to talk about conviction? You want to talk about conviction? I told them yes, and they believed me. They trusted that what I said would happen. They trusted that what I said I was going to do, I'm going to do. Because they trusted me, right? They trusted the person who said it. Faith bridged the gap. Faith made it real. Faith gave the two of them confidence and assurance that faith was the evidence and the conviction that what was promised that they would experience. Faith allows me and you to treat the future as the present and the invisible as seen. Think about that. Faith allows me and you to treat the future as present and the invisible as seen. A minute ago, I quoted Charles Spurgeon and that he said, faith was the instrument that we use to accept salvation. I want to wrap this faith conversation up 
a little neatly and put a little bow on it. Me and you are saved by grace through faith. Ephesians chapter 2 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is what? A gift from God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is the way my little simple brain puts it. And y'all, don't start saying that this is not theologically accurate. I'm not, this is Ed visualizing stuff. Someday I'm going to be on exhibit up there. Angels are going to walk by and they're going to say, see that Griffin Hagen dude? That joker was lost as a goose and wasn't worth saving, but he's here in heaven today. And it is only by the grace and mercy of God that he was saved and brought here. And it was right in the middle of my own unlovableness. It was right smack in the middle of being sinful. Romans chapter 5 says, just as I was weak and just while I was in the middle of being a sinner, that's when Christ died for me. Think about how much that makes no sense, right? Grace is me getting exactly what I don't deserve. It's the most unbelievable thing. The song says it's amazing, this grace. It is amazing. That's like the understatement, y'all, of the century. And I receive that through faith, right? I would say that this crazy, amazing, illogical, shocking grace, that is what saved a wretch like me. Right in the middle of me being wretched. Saving faith is produced by the saving grace of our Heavenly Father. Saving faith is produced by the saving grace of our Heavenly Father. Salvation is received by means of faith. Paul says that it is the grace that saves us and faith is the tool that allows us to accept that. 2,700 years ago, 2,700 years ago, the prophet Habakkuk said the just, the righteous, shall live by his faith. Lord, let me live the rest of my life by that faith. Lord, thank you for allowing me to have that faith. Lord, I pray that anybody here that, that has not said yes to you would say yes to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let me say this to y'all. If you have never said yes to that offer, if you've never said yeah, if you have not ever said, I want to accept that grace, if you have never believed, it is not this big complicated thing. Number one, I repent of my sin. A gospel without repentance is half the gospel, y'all. Repentance has to take place. Does repentance mean that you're perfect on the other side of it? Absolutely not. That's a lie from hell. But repentance is me turning away from it. I'm turning away from my sin. And then I believe that what happened on that cross was real. Really real. I believe it in my head. I believe it in my heart. And I believe that grave was really empty. Did I just think it was empty? No, it was empty. He walked out of that grave. He ran out of that grave alive. And so I believe that. And faith is the evidence and the conviction that that is as real. Did I see it? No, I didn't see it. Faith allows me to believe it just as if I saw it. It makes the invisible visible. Y'all, that is, that is the gospel. I repent and I believe. Period. And so I would invite, and you know, turn the lights down a little bit. If you have never done that, this cross is open to you. For sure, if you just need prayer, our prayer team is going to be in the back. Or you can come down front, whatever you want to do. But I would encourage you to consider today saying yes to that offer. And all it is is I repent and I believe and I ask the Lord to save me. And he will save you. He absolutely will save you. Let me pray. Lord, I lift up this church family to you. Lord, all of us have friends and lots and lots of us have family members that are lost. 
And Lord, I would pray, I read a verse a little while ago, Romans 1.16. Lord, I would pray that none of us would be ashamed of the gospel. That we would be bold in our faith. Not condescending, though, Lord. Compassionate truth. That we would have the boldness, that you would give us the boldness to speak the truth with compassion to our friends and family. Lord, I weep that people die lost every day. Lord, please let this church be a church that goes out into the streets, that goes into the living rooms of their family, that, that goes out to eat with their family and their friends that are lost, that don't believe, and just talk about you with them and share your gospel. Let us be those people. Let us be those people that do it with love and compassion, but with truth. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.